So Chris Valletta is an award-winning entrepreneur, author, media contributor, and for former NFL player. In addition to authoring numerous articles highlighting the potential of athletes in the workforce, Chris wrote the best-selling book, Team Works. He also wrote another book recently with, that was inspired by his son, Christian Valletta, called A Balloon on the Moon. So a fun children's book. So take a look at that. And with that, I want us to give a warm welcome to Chris Valletta. I love Amy Little. She's one of my favorite people on earth. She's the perfect blend of love and tenacity, in my opinion. How y'all doing? Yeah. Welcome to Nashville. It's by a round of applause, who went to Tootsie's last night? Okay, who went somewhere other than Tootsie's last night? Oh, all right. You failed. You got to go to Tootsie's when you come to Nashville. So go tonight after the, after the casino night. Tootsie's was, you know, is, is iconic. It was, was uh, started in 1960. If you were anything in country music, you had to perform at Tootsie's. That was a requirement. Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Garth Brooks, all the bigs all perform at Tootsie's. And I grew up in a, in a, in a musical family. My dad plays, you know, a bunch of guitars, bass guitar. He could play anything. Mom was a singer, brother was a drums, I played saxophone, I played violin, believe it or not. I was pretty good at it, too. Um, so we, I grew up in a musical family, and so my first visit to Nashville, I got to go to Tootsie's. I was a junior in college, and I was, like, elated just to be in the presence of the, uh, you know, be in the place where so many icons had performed. And, you know, like, I threw out a, a comment to a buddy of mine that, that I was there with, and I said, man, can you imagine what it would be like to get up on stage and sing Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash. Because Johnny Cash is like my jam. I could listen to him all the time. And my buddy, who thinks I'm crazy half the time, he said, yeah, that would be, that'd be incredible. I'll go see if I can make that happen. And he walks up to the stage. I was started laughing. Of course, no one gets on stage at Tootsie's. It doesn't even matter. And he gives something to the lead singer. And the lead singer takes the microphone off the stand. She just looks at me in a full crowd of people and just goes, here you go. And I looked at my buddy and he goes, get up there. So I am playing football at the time. So I'm six foot three. I'm uh, about 240 right now. But at the time, I was a big boy. I was 315 pounds. And I was, uh, you know, 12,000 calories a day. But this is my moment, right? So I get up on stage and <clears throat> fully try to prepare myself for what I was about to do. Perform in the same spot as these icons? There was just one problem. I can't sing worth a crap. <laughs> Not at all. Like zero. I cannot carry a tune. But I didn't care. I said, you know what? Who cares? They might not have fun or enjoy it, but I sure am. So I cut loose, ripped it out, voice cracking, looking like crazy. I know I sounded crazy, but you know what the audience did? They really got into it. And I finished the song, and the place erupted. And I'm not kidding. Like, to this day, it was one of my personal greatest achievements in life. It was also sort of a massive failure when you think about it. But for, to me, my perspective was it was, it was fantastic. And what I love about Nashville is Nashville wasn't just home to that success or failure. Nashville was also home to one of my greatest personal achievements and greatest failures in my life. I, my, uh, ha I had the opportunity to play football for a living. You know, I grew up in Texas. I've told a few people here in the state of Texas, football ranks in priority with oxygen and Jesus. That's right where... <laughs> football is, okay? It's a big deal. Uh, my family moved there when I was younger, and we kind of got immersed in that culture. And so I went on, I played football at Texas A&M University. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I, whenever I say that, I wait to see if I just, if there's a single Aggie. There's one? Raise your hand if you're an Aggie. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, great. Beautiful. There's two. That's all I need. Um, but played at Texas A&M University, and my first team in the NFL was the Tennessee Titans. 
And you know, I moved here with um, you know, the hopes and dreams sort of coming to fruition as a kid. You, know, you, you grow up and you think about wanting to play in the NFL and, and then it happens. And I, I go in this locker room and at the time, there were some, you know, some players that I had just idolized. One in particular, you may not have heard of unless you're sort of really into the sport, but there was a player, an offensive lineman, which was the position I played, and there was a guy by the name of Bruce Matthews who was an offensive lineman for the Tennessee Titans, previously the Houston Oilers. Now, what's impressive about Bruce is not the fact that he played 21 seasons in the NFL. That's not what's impressive. What's most impressive is that he never missed a start. 21 years as an offensive lineman running into people for a living with bad intentions. And he never missed a start. So um, Bruce Matthews was an icon at my position. And I grew up just idolizing him. And now I'm playing for the Tennessee Titans and who walks into the locker room as the starting right guard for the Tennessee Titans? Bruce Matthews. He started his first NFL game when I was four years old. And now I'm in the locker room next to this guy? I felt like I made it. It's kind of strange when I got hazed by Bruce Matthews shortly thereafter. <laughs> he shaved my head in 17 different directions you know, made me like spin around in a bat and run and then they duct taped me to the goalpost. It was like, but I enjoyed every second of it. They said I was the only guy that ever like smiled and laughed through getting hazed. Because I'm being hazed as an NFL football player. It was like my dream coming true, who cares? My hair will grow back. But my greatest failure also happened in Tennessee. Because I got a, uh, something called in the, in the player world, it's called a shoulder tap when you're standing in the locker room and you're you know, doing whatever you might be doing and someone comes up behind your shoulder and gives you the tap and you turn around. Usually it's a position coach like a strength and conditioning coach or an operations person in the office. But the shoulder tap means you're about to get fired. So I go in at the time, it was coach Jeff Fisher. I go in, I sit down at his desk. He comes in the office and, and goes to close his door, and before his door even closes shut, he already says to me, gotta let you go. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean you gotta let me go? I don't, I don't understand. Listen, you played hard, you were great. We have some injuries at other positions, we gotta make some room. We have too, too many offensive linemen to begin with. Sorry, we gotta let you go. The one thing in my life, the one talent I had that I was the best at, the better than like 99% of other football, the, the one thing just got taken away from me. What would you do in that case if the one talent you felt you had most was just gone? How would you feel? See, in the athlete community for pros, this is called the wilderness period. And every athlete goes through it at that level when the lights go out and the game is over and they don't know what to do. It's a scary proposition. And it's scary because, you know, these people end up typically, several of them, with a lot of money and not a clue how to manage it or what to do with it. It's one of the reasons in the NFL, close to 80% of the players who play more than five years go broke. It drives me crazy. It drives me crazy because they don't necessarily know how valuable they are to themselves, and they certainly don't know the value and contribution they can make to others by virtue of the instincts that they have. You see, I believe, and I've spent, you know, the big part of my business career, developing teams of people who understand that athletic background. I love hiring athletes because I believe athletes by virtue of the skills they instinctively possess represent one of the most qualified yet untapped sources of leadership talent in the workforce today. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm about to give you an unlock 
to becoming a leader of consequence. I'm in a room of leaders. Locum Smart, HCOs, vendors. I'm in a group, I'm in a room full of leaders. The question is, how do you as leaders develop your teams and what are the skills required to do so? You see, when I was 16 years old, my high school football coach gave me an unlock to becoming a leader of consequence. And that unlock is what prevented me from even getting close to entering that wilderness period when I got fired. Now I went on, I played for a couple more teams, you know, went through that whole experience, but every single time I went through the experience, I had the same initial feeling and then bounced right back. Why? Well, I'll tell you the story. It does require a little bit of imagination, so I hope you can go there with me. When I was 16 years old, my high school football coach walked up to me and said, well, he asked me a question. He said, I need to ask you a question. I really just started playing for the team. He said, are you a rope holder? I was like, wait, a what? <laughs> a rope holder? Why? What is that? And then he told me a story, and he described something. And so I'm going to share this with you, and I want you to imagine it with me. He said, I want you to imagine yourself hanging off the side of a cliff by a rope. That a thousand feet beneath you is a rocky bluff. The cliff is jagged, tons of sharp edges. If you fall or you let go, it's over. You're going to die. At the other end of your rope stands one person. Who do you want that person to be? My coach asked me. So I ask you, who would your rope holder be? What skills and qualities do they need to possess? Clearly strength, the talent of strength, the physical ability to hold you up, clearly that's a prerequisite, right? They've got to be able to hold you. But you know as well as I do that strength is meaningless once pain and fatigue start to set in. Because strong arms without a strong mind are meaningless. So I ask you to right now picture in your mind who your rope holder would be. Who is the one person in your life who would go down to the bottom with you before, before they would ever let you go? What skills does that person have? Give me some of them. Tell me. Shout them out. Empathy. Empathy. Tenacity. Integrity. Tenacity. Love. Love. Loyalty. Loyalty. Commitment. Commitment. What was that? Stamina. Stamina. This was the unlock my coach gave me at 16 years old. Because he said, if you want to build a championship organization, you must have a team of rope holders. There's no other way. Because athletes have a unique perspective. As do many of you, your leaders in business, you've been around the block. The ability for people to perform under pressure, handle adversity, be dedicated, disciplined, have desire. Working within a multicultural team dynamic. How to respond when you lose. How to respond when you win. How to celebrate. How to develop culture. Communication. The importance of being coached. Empathy. Grit. Loyalty. Stamina. This is what makes a team a team. Because the word team is an acronym. Together, each achieves more. But before you can achieve more, you first have to figure out, how do I become a rope holder? Because I know probably many of you, there's probably a few people in the organization that if you were holding their rope, you'd be like,
And I think there are probably a few people in the organization that you would identify as a rope holder. I give a lot of uh, talks, and I love it, because I love interacting and meeting new people. I've met so many amazing people. Um, I was doing a similar uh, uh, talk at, uh, Amy, where's Amy, is she in here? You're in the back, of course, holding down the fort, in the back, pushing everybody up. Um, I, Amy's husband, uh, John, and I are, are great friends. I, I, I just think the world of him. He's a Marine. Um, he's just a committed dad. He's smart. Um, and we, we coach our kids' flag football teams together, and we shoot guns together, and we eat steaks together, and all that stuff. He's, he's awesome. But I was actually asked to come and speak at his uh, previous company he worked for and give a similar uh, you know, conversation to mine. Um, it was a small enough group where I could, I could interact, with each other, you know, interact with everybody differently. But I actually asked the group, who's a rope holder in your organization? I think John was with the company, Amy, probably what, six months, maybe four months? Four months. He had been with the company four months. And five people out of like 30 said, oh, John Little. Let me tell you why that's important. <laughs> We need people that understand the importance of making an impact, not just an impression. Because we are in the middle, in every industry of business, especially healthcare, every industry of business, governments, families, we are in the middle of the greatest cultural erosion of leadership that the country has ever seen. Full stop. We do not have rope holders in this country anymore. We are so bogged down with the minutia nonsense that it clouds our perspective on what's most important and the only way we are gonna stay globally competitive. What makes a team a team? It's when people understand what it means to be together. And the only way to do that is if you have a rope holder mindset, is to stop pointing your fingers at everything that's wrong in business, everything that's wrong with families. Oh, if the government just did this, or if our company just did this, or if you know my brother would only do this. It's to stop pointing the fingers and do what our coach used to tell us to do. Use your thumbs. We have to look inward first, before we can ever be together. So there are a laundry list of things you can do to develop a rope holder mindset, because it truly is like a muscle. You've got to exercise it in order for it to develop and grow. But I picked a few. I picked a few things that I think are relevant, especially in the context of, of today's world. and I thought I'd share them with you. The first is ego. You have to understand the importance of the role that ego plays in your ability to fully function as a team of rope holders. I will try to put ego in a context that's appropriate for a healthcare audience. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. I'll say that again. <laughs> Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. It is a complete and total cloud and a blind spot and unnecessary. And it's either fixed or removed, full stop. There are two kinds of ego. There is ego strength, and there is ego drive, and they are two very different things, very different things. In short, ego drive is it's all about me. What do you think ego strength is? It's all about you. Selfless, 
exceptionalism. David Cook, in his book, Greatness, talks about the concept of selfless exceptionalism. This idea that when you stop pointing fingers and make true changes in and of yourself, and you understand that you don't need to have an ego. The 2023 word of the year from Webster's Dictionary, does anyone know what it is? Nope. Authentic. It was the most, apparently the most searched word. And I found that fascinating. Because authenticity comes when the words you say are true and you believe what you say. And truly authentic people don't have an ego because they understand the strength that comes from that. Ego strength. It's this idea that I can be authentic to who I am and what I believe and, and why I care and what I want to do and how I want to care for people. And I can pour that out into the world. And that is a huge first step of being a great teammate. Now, you're in your internal cultures and your organizations. You understand who has the egos and who doesn't. This is the hard part. Oftentimes, A players have the biggest ego drives. What do you do then? Well, I'll tell you this. If together each achieves more, you will not achieve more if you have ego players on your team. You can't. First team I ever played for in college, Texas a my, my freshman year, 11 out of the 11 players on defense and nine out of the 10 starting players on offense, the starters, all played in the NFL for more than five years, every one of them. The talent was unbelievable. We went six and six that season. We had more talent than any other team in the country. We should have won a national championship. We went six and six. Why? Oh, the ego drive was insane. It ripped our team apart. But when you have a team full of people who have selfless exceptionalism, this idea that I'm just going to pour into my teammates because in so doing, they will pour into me and all boats rise with the tides and together, each will achieve more. The second thing I want to talk about as it relates to building a rope holder culture is the concept of why. Um, I hope, hopefully several people in here have listened to the economist and author Simon Sinek. And if you haven't, um, please write that down and go back and watch his 18-minute TED Talk. I think it's like the third highest viewed of all time. And I think it's called How Leaders Inspire Action, but it's all based on the premise of one of his books that's titled Start With Why. And he talks about how people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so... He gives some examples that I just love. Like, uh, you know, when you think about inspiring businesses or inspiring leaders over the course of history or people that changed the, the course of history, he paints a couple of pictures. He talks about Martin Luther King. You know, there were plenty of great orators and pastors of the time. I mean, there, he wasn't the only one. Why, why did he become, you know, the, the, the big dog? You know, the, the Wright brothers. There wasn't, there's no reason they should have figured out powered man flight. Why did they do it? when there were tons of others going after it. And he talked about how people like MLK, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. The Wright brothers had no college education and they, were, they owned a bicycle shop. And they used spare parts to build an airplane. No one working for them had engineering degrees or college degrees, they were all doing it because the Wright brothers believed that they would change the course of history. While at the same time, this guy named Samuel Pierpont Langley, who no one's ever heard of, had funding from the War Department, was, you know, worked at the Smithsonian, was on the board at Harvard, had all the engineers, had all the press following him everywhere, and he was chasing riches. 
he was one of the starters on my six and six team, chasing what was next, chasing the result, not the reason. I was sitting at table 21 earlier, um, and by the way, kudos to this group. I don't know if anyone noticed, but my respect for how hardcore this group is is, is, at, a, as a, is at an all-time high. Did you notice how no one flinched when the fire alarm went off in the opening <laughs> session? Did you catch that? I like perked up and then everyone was like, eh, we got it, no, no big deal. It's just a little fire, we'll, we'll, we'll get out of here if we need to. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was, that was great, kudos to you guys. But I was sitting at 21 and I had a very lovely conversation with Melissa, who goes by Mel, who just moved from Ohio to Idaho uh, and took on a new role at a new hospital. And I asked you why, can you shout out the reason you said? And what was that culture that you told me? That patients, put first. patients put first. How many people would say that the objective of this industry, the reason we're all here, is to put the patient first? Raise your hands up high so everybody can see them. Okay, everybody, for the most part. Putting the patient first, better patient care. How many people actually do it? So when I asked Mel, to tell me, what does that mean, putting the patient first? I want you to explain it, because I, I, I don't want to do it. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Do you mind? <laughs> you, you'll do a better job. It's more authentic. I don't know about that. So, putting the patient first for me means that in every decision that we make, that we're looking at where does the patient fall in that, and what is that in um, any service line that we open, is that in um, any provider that we hire, um, oh, that their um, quality is looking at the patients, that they're spending their time with the patients. So it's, it's within everything that I do and every decision that I make is where is that patient. And so, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I want to be in and it sounds like Mel has a CEO that is fully bought into that culture of, of putting the patient first, and what struck me most about what she said was not the North Star of putting the patient first, because that's a noble endeavor. What struck me was how she said, every decision we make is put through the filter of putting the patient first. So how would this industry change if our collective why was the pursuit of better patient care. Not just better patient care, but the pursuit of it. It's not a question I can answer. It's a question you can. And there's no better place to do it in a conference like this, when you've collided three industries that work together, and there's really smart people in this room, and you've checked the egos at the door and you operate out of a spirit of authenticity like Mel did with me. And you make decisions that make an impact and not just an impression. The pursuit of better patient care is a noble pursuit. And you've, you've forgotten more about the industry than I'll ever know, but in my conversations with members of this team, I've heard a few people independently talk about the challenges in rural areas and poverty-stricken communities. So I have a challenge to this organization and the, the organizations. The pursuit of better patient care can't be for the few. It's got to be for the many, because together each achieves more. And if this room was full of 100% rope holders, full of people who operated out of more ego strength than ego drive, full of people who understood why it is they do what they do, you would change the world. And that is a cliche, but it's not you would change the world.
And I would encourage you to do so. Lower the walls. The last speaker, Steve, gave a, an incredible talk because I thought it focused a lot on perspective. I mean, seriously. I'm married. I have two kids, two boys. They're 10 and 8. My wife and my boys are my world. My world. And sometimes I allow the busyness and the craziness of the game to distract my focus on what I know is most important. I thought one of the things he said that was most salient to me was, do you use your medical insurance? Yes. Do you use your dental insurance? Yes. Do you use your vision insurance? Yes. Do you use your PTO? <laughs> Gold. Because we don't. You can never be expected to take care of others and be an effective teammate if you don't take care of yourself. And I say that not as someone who's taking, you know, who's doing it, doing it the right way. I say I'm somebody who's in pursuit of doing it the right way. And in the last session, I extracted so much value out of those words because of the authenticity that came with it. This is what's missing. This is what's missing in business, in life, in government. Oh my gosh. All right, I won't go there. Um, but I do want to talk to you about one more thing. You know, when we started my company, Mission, I'm, uh, Mission is a consumer products brand. We make wearable cooling innovations. So, and, and we believe the heat should never slow you down. It's also uh, a detriment. The heat's very unsafe. Everyone's been too hot. The heat has a disproportionate impact on low income and minority communities who are five times more likely to die of heat illness than the rest. If you're a Hispanic worker in the United States, you're 91% more likely to die of a heat stroke. The heat's the number one weather-related killer in the United States, more than tornadoes and hurricanes combined. You probably hear a lot of uh, heat-related issues in the summertime. That's my business. We sell products to help keep you cool, safe, comfortable, so you can do more of what you love. And it's a great business. It started 15 years ago, but we started it working on professional athletes. And we, at the time, there was an up-and-coming tennis player by the name of Serena Williams, who turned out had a pretty good career. <laughs> but we actually partnered with her and um, Drew Brees and Dwayne Wade. And we kind of proved products on them first before we ever brought them to market. It's good enough for them, it's good enough for you. That was our consumer pitch. But there was something happened with Serena in particular that reinforced this next tip to building a rope holder culture, which is something I refer to as the little things. And I'll get to the Serena story in a second, because the little things happen to be the name of a drill my college offensive line coach would do. And so if you're ever, does anyone, well, I'm, all right, forget, I won't test your football knowledge. It's all good. Um, offensive linemen are those big guys in the front that put their hands on the ground, okay? I mentioned earlier they run into people at high velocities with bad intentions, right? That was a lot of fun. Um, so my coach in college actually put us through every day a drill called the little things. He'd line us up. We would have to go through what our stance looked like, what our feet position would look like, the alignment to the other players, our steps that we would take in our first step. So the things I'm going through right now are quite literally what you do as a peewee football player. Like the very first time you ever put a helmet on, you do this kind of stuff. And a Division I, you know, premier SEC, greatest university on the face of God's green earth at Texas A&M, <laughs> our coach decides to do this little thing every single day without fail. We never missed it. And his philosophy was simple. If you do the little things correctly, if you stay disciplined, when the ball snaps and a play starts and all hell breaks loose, you'll instinctively fall on what you know because it becomes automatic. And the word in that little things discussion 
is discipline. Mike Tyson defines discipline as doing what, you, what you, doing what you hate like you love it. I don't know any other way to describe it, do you? <laughs> Discipline's not easy. But here's the lesson about the little things. If you take care of the little things, you'll take care of the big things. And the little things is a daily, habitual habit and discipline on the details that matter in your organization, in your family, and elsewhere. My family is a, you know, we are a faith-filled family. Our faith is really important to us. It is a daily, habitual habit that we must eat breakfast together and pray together. That's us. Everyone has their, their rituals, their routines. When you build the discipline of getting into the little details that are going to mean the difference between success and failure, you position yourself for an opportunity to win. Because the chasm between success and failure, or being an industry leader and being an industry dominator, disruptor, pioneer, that chasm is infinitely deep but it's only inches wide. The details of your daily activity are what makes up those inches. What are you doing when you wake up? What are you doing when you brush your teeth? What are you thinking about? Do you start every single meeting in your organization with why? Do you put your process development, do you put your infrastructure through the filter that we talked about with Mel? If we believe in the pursuit of better patient care, is that the filter upon which decisions are made? And how do you hold yourself accountable to those decisions? It's through discipline. And I would encourage you, a very simple little thing you can do is to begin every single meeting you attend. Phone calls, video conference meetings, in-person meetings, especially those, with why you do what you do. As an organization, Separately, I would highly encourage your organizations to lead a, a, an exercise in helping people under, uh, understand and discover their own personal why. My reason for being on this planet is to radiate love and joy and to offer a perspective on authenticity that has changed my life. Now it happens to, I try to pull that through to my business and find ways to deliver that same message through our, our offering. But what it does is when it becomes automatic and part of my daily habitual habit, where I'm constantly radiating positivity. I mean, like, I would take on hell with a squirt gun. Like, I'm positive. But it's to put that out in the world and to rally people along with me and to encourage and lift up and guide and motivate and inspire and create vision and paint a picture of impact for people that may not be able to paint it themselves. That's what I do. And I attract people that do the same thing. And together, each achieves more. So when we first partnered with Serena, we did a production shoot with her. It was a video shoot in Florida at her home tennis club. So there's multiple courts. We got all this production equipment. We started a company. I'm trying to like make sure we got one of the best tennis players in the world. I'm trying to make, my job was her. I am solely responsible for Serena Williams and anything she needs. Great. We go through a few shoots. We have to break down the equipment and shift over to another court. And it was gonna take about 15 minutes. And so I said, hey, Serena, you, if you wanna run inside, like just kind of, you know, go to the bathroom, get some water, whatever, we'll, we'll come back out, we'll start right up. She said, okay, great. So she went inside. 15 minutes comes and goes, we're, you know, the crew's ready to start, set up again. And Serena's nowhere to be found. So I just said, all right, I'll, I, she went up in the clubhouse, I'll go look for her. And so 
I went in there and I couldn't find her anywhere. And finally, someone heard that I was looking for her and they came up to me and they said, she's in the weight room. I was like, she's in the weight room? She's work, like, she's in the like, fitness room? Like, what? <laughs> she's working out? So I go in there. Sure enough, Serena Williams on the elliptical machine cranking as hard as she could. And I walked up to her, and I was like, Serena, hey, um, we, we only had 15 minutes. And she looked at me and she said, she stopped the machine, she stepped down, she looked me in the eyes, and she said, 15 minutes is better than no minutes. <laughs> I think she went on to have a pretty darn good tennis career, didn't she? She understood that the chasm between success and failure, or winning a tennis match versus being the greatest of all time, was infinitely deep, but it was only inches wide. She knew that 15 minutes might actually be the extra inch she needs in reach at the Australian Open in the third set when it's 120 degrees on the surface of the court. She understands that it's the details that matter, that it's a habitual practice and discipline of the details that matter. I'm gonna close with this. The most important thing to becoming a rope holder and to developing a rope holder culture is the requirement for each and every one of you to make a choice. When my, so in my house, we've got sort of these back stairs that kind of come down to the kitchen and then you got the front stairs that no one uses, like well, that's our setup. Um, and I have, you know, 10 and eight year old boys. It's a WWE, you know, wrestling match in my house 24 seven. I love it because that's what I did with my brother. <laughs> it's fun to watch my wife react to some of that stuff. But I, I focus a lot, and my wife and I focus a lot on the importance of making choices. Because, you know, it, it's, it's hard, right? If you have kids, it's hard. They don't understand. It's, it's discipline in, you know, how we speak to them about it. And I have this big sign that I made when they're coming down those back steps. It's kind of on the wall, and... It's just huge, you can't miss it when you're coming down in the morning. And it says, make your choice. Make your choice. And I put it there because I sort of want them to get in the habit, like when you know the players are, when Rudy Rudiger was running out of the stadium at Notre Dame and they touched the play like a champion today sign. I want that sign to serve in the same capacity. Because they can make a choice about how they're going to respond to authority figures. They can make a choice about how they're going to think, things that they're gonna think about, the games they're gonna participate in, uh, the things they may see online, offline. I can't put them in a bubble. They have to have a filter upon which to make decisions that align to values. Because while we're in the middle of this cultural erosion of leadership, you have to understand what culture is. Culture is the immune system of your organizations, made up of individuals who each have different agendas, different levels of ego, different priorities, different motivations, different backgrounds, different communication styles, different cultures. It's hard, it's hard to manage all that. What's required is a perspective inward, not outward, perspective inward of every single person First, to check your ego, to understand your personal reason for being, to practice the daily habitual habits of the little things, and to most importantly, make the choice that you want to be there. Because we need more rope holders in this world. Mel's CEO, what's his name again? Ed. Tell Ed I said hi. Ed lives the values that he preaches. He doesn't just put them on a PowerPoint slide and say they're important. 
It's the filter for the business. Because this is our time for choosing. You have to choose to make those changes and make those perspective shifts internally, otherwise nothing can happen. And the organization has to choose to align themselves to a set of values that become the filter to make decisions. The pursuit of better patient care is a noble mission. It's a challenging mission. It's a great mission. What are the things you're doing to make that the filter? Finally, in line with it being our time for choosing, there was a political speech given in the mid-1960s. Um, and this is not a left or right thing. It was done by Ronald Reagan. It was actually before he even got in politics. But you know, he was big on speaking out, about, speaking out against communism and socialism. And he was actually giving a speech in, in 1964. And the historians have sort of labeled it or titled it A Time for Choosing, even though that wasn't the name of his actual speech. But in the context of speaking about communism and socialism, he said this. We're at war with the greatest enemy that's ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said that if we lose this war, and in so doing lose this way of life of ours, History will record with the greatest of astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. And so all these years later, I take those words and I put them up against the crisis we face today and the war we're in today. I think confidently, we could say that there are some cultural challenges in the United States. Businesses, governments, families, it's, it's hard out there. We've seen an erosion of leadership. What I haven't seen is anybody that has a plan to change it. This is why it's our time for choosing, and this is why in an industry like healthcare, which is so critically important to our infrastructure, so critically important to everything we are and what we do, with the three industries in this room, you can change the world. What are you going to do about it? Don't just go through the motions. Take advantage of the 15 minutes. Innovate, ideate, drop the egos. Come from authenticity. Tell people why you do what you do. It doesn't matter if they disagree with you. That's totally okay. Why did we get in the habit of starting to persecute people that disagree with us? Disagreement's a good thing. Especially when you're disagreeing, but when there's a disagreement between two people who have more ego strength than ego drive. Because then it's not a disagreement, it's a debate. It's a discussion. Rid yourself of the virus that becomes egos. Egos are the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. If you hang on to egos, even though they're A players, your chances of success are drastically lower. Take a C player with ego drive. Sorry, take a C player with ego strength before you take an A player with ego drive. And make this your time for choosing, okay? Leave this conference making a choice about how you can make an impact to yourself, your family, your coworkers, and your north star of the pursuit of better patient care. Take it on. What are you waiting for? You could have a heart attack any minute. And just know that when I speak to you, I speak to myself. I get so burned down and burned out sometimes in the busyness of what I do that it's so hard to keep my eyes fixed. But you know what's great? I have an army of rope holders around me that tell me when I need to be adjusted. When my coordinates and my heading need to be shifted.
And I've dropped the ego to where I let that bother me. I let that fuel me because I know where they're coming from. This is when magic happens, people. This is how we avert the crisis in our country. This is how we stay globally competitive in this geopolitical madness that's going on right now. And this is how we lead. Leadership in one word is responsibility. It is your responsibility. It is mine. And let's take it, okay? Thank you.